second uh, speaker is actually going to be Professor Mark Potenza, and who's going to talk to us on the psychopharmacological interventions in addiction medicine. Thank you, and uh, Alex, please feel free to keep me on time to make sure that uh, we give Hamed enough time for uh, his presentation, uh, to which I'm looking forward. So I'll be speaking today on uh, psychopharmacological uh, treatments. I have a listing of disclosures with respect to pharmaceutical, gambling, gaming, and legal entities. And I thought I would put the um, medication treatments in the framework of uh, disorders for which we have FDA-indicated medications that include uh, opioid, alcohol, and tobacco use disorders, for example, and those without FDA-indicated medications um, where treatment development may be um, particularly um, important. And these include both substance use disorders uh, like cannabis, cocaine, methamphetamine use disorders, as well as as behavioral addictions like gambling and gaming disorders. And I'll consider um, uh, for these disorders uh, without FDA indicated um, medications, uh, randomized clinical uh, trial data uh, with a focus on uh, gambling disorder. So with respect to opioid use disorder, for uh, decades we've had multiple um, uh, medications with FDA indications going back now over 50 years for uh, methadone, um, partial agonists like uh, buprenorphine as well as antagonists like naltrexone, um, as well as medications that help with uh, withdrawal um, and with overdose. Uh, and it should be noted that withdrawal is very uncomfortable, but overdose typically uh, is the um, more fatal um, uh, incident. Uh, so um, getting naloxone into the community and being mindful that naloxone has a relatively short half-life so that when people uh, resuscitate, they are still in danger of uh, potentially um, having respiratory depression. Um, and then there are also harm reduction approaches that are being implemented, including self-injection um, uh, sites. Uh, and there are debates over their usage as well as um, uh, medication-assisted uh, treatments in general. With respect to alcohol use disorders, there are multiple medications that have uh, FDA indications um, and they work uh, through different uh, mechanisms. Uh, these may be used uh, for different populations. So for example, naltrexone tends to be uh, particularly helpful for individuals who are highly motivated. Uh, so for example, uh, physicians who have um, troubles with um, alcohol use disorder um, may um, benefit um, particularly from uh, naltrexone. Um, and then there are long-acting uh, formulations, uh, for example, of opioid receptor antagonists uh, that have their pros and cons. So um, usually prior to using the uh, long-acting formulations, it's um, beneficial to uh, try the short-acting to make sure that it's well tolerated. Uh, with tobacco use disorder, again, uh, there are uh, replacement therapies that uh, work on uh, nicotinic uh, receptors as well as uh, partial agonists like uh, vreniclin, as well as medications that work through um, alternate um, mechanisms. And then uh, more recently, there's been a role for electronic nicotine delivery systems, although this is uh, controversial, uh, particularly since these devices, vaping devices, jewels, uh, may be used by youth and they may initiate engagement in addictive behaviors and in some cases, uh, depending on the contents, uh, have been associated with lung uh, damage. So with uh, cannabis use disorder, there are no um, FDA-indicated uh, medications, although there are data uh, to support, um, to varying degrees, gabapentin, uh, cannabinoid analogs, and acetylcysteine, and other agents in the treatment of cannabis use disorder. Uh, there have been debates regarding the pros and cons of cannabis, as it's been promoted to treat a number of conditions, but there are often uh, little data to support its usage, um, and many... Um, uh, jurisdictions are legalizing uh, cannabis, including here in uh, Thailand, um, with uh, potential public health uh, consequences. And there are hundreds of components, um, many of which are um, uh, psychoactive uh, within uh, cannabis uh, where delta-9 THC is typically associated with the euphoria or high as well as some of the uh, psychotogenic uh, potential, uh, whereas uh, cannabidiol or CBD uh, may have more um, 
protective effects against some of these um, adverse uh, consequences. Um, and um, I'll point towards a, a review uh, by Jack Kalsa and colleagues that um, considers um, the wider use of uh, cannabinoids as uh, medicines. So with uh, stimulant use disorders like cocaine use disorder and methamphetamine use disorder, uh, there has been a longstanding interest in developing medications for these uh, conditions. Uh, some of the complexities about medication development uh, relate to, um, for example, uh, the similarities of D2-like dopamine receptors where uh, D2 and D3 um, seem to have uh, potentially opposing um, roles in uh, cocaine use disorder for for example. Um, so uh, there has been focus on other systems. One that we've been interested in is in glutamate uh, systems, and there are a number of medications uh, such as beta-lactam beta antibiotics like uh, clavulonic acid, uh, uh, as well as m 5 um, antagonists, either uh, positive or negative allostatic allosteric modulators um, that may have potential in the, the treatment of um, cocaine use disorder, as well as uh, nutraceuticals like N-acetylcysteine, which I'll describe in greater detail uh, later. And some of these have been reviewed in some of the articles listed at the, the bottom. So uh, with respect to behavioral addictions, um, there are now two um, formal behavioral addictions included in the ICD-11. And these include uh, gaming disorder and gambling disorder. And the um, medication trials for uh, gaming disorder, also termed internet gaming disorder in the DSM-5, um, have been relatively few. And they've um, focused on medications that have indications for um, disorders that commonly co-occur with gaming disorder, uh, such as bupropion and escitalopram, uh, which have indications for depression, and methylphenidate and atomoxetine, uh, which have indications for ADHD. Um, small trials conducted to date, um, but these agents have shown varying degrees of promise. Uh, with respect to gambling disorder, uh, a wider range of medications have been uh, tested, um, and these include multiple classes, including serotonin reuptake inhibitors, opioid receptor antagonists, antipsychotic agents, um, uh, particularly second generation, as well as uh, mood stabilizers. Um, and arguably, the, de the best data are with opioid receptor antagonists, and the initial pharmacotherapy trials were um, based on proposed biological features that link to aspects of the disorder. So specifically going back about 20 years ago, um, Eric Collender and I proposed that uh, specific neurotransmitter systems might link to specific aspects of um, uh, gambling disorder and other uh, disorders uh, defined by impaired impulse control. And um, some of the um, initial studies uh, included focusing on serotonin given its role in um, behavioral initiation and cessation or impulse control. And so these are data from uh, Kim uh, et al., uh, now, again, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, looking at paroxetine treatment. And in this uh, single site randomized uh, clinical trial, uh, paroxetine was found to be superior to placebo in terms of uh, generating uh, clinical improvement. This led to a, a multi-site study in which we were involved uh, that uh, was led by John Grant. Uh, and um, what was found here was uh, no difference between um, active drug and placebo. Um, the, this study was complicated by the um, high placebo response rate where um, active drug was linked to clinical improvement in close to 60% of uh, patients, uh, whereas placebo was linked to clinical improvement in close to 50% of patients. So it raises the question of what might underlie um, uh, active versus placebo responses. So um, one thing to note and one thing that I think is important within clinical practice is to note that um, with gambling disorder, co-occurring disorders are more the norm than the exception. So data from the uh, National Comorbidity Replication Study indicate that 96% of individuals with gambling disorder have one or more additional uh, psychiatric disorder, and close to two-thirds have three or more. And I think that these co-occurring disorders might, be, um, might provide guidance as to which treatments might be most effective. 
Um, this is um, a, a, a graphic demonstration of those data uh, from a, a review that we um, published in uh, Nature Reviews Disease Primers. And one can see that um, for substance use disorders, impulse control disorders, um, uh, affective disorders, including both anxiety and depressive disorders, there are high rates of co-occurrence across a range of disorders. Uh, similarly, when we looked at the um, NISARC data, which surveyed over 43,000 individuals, uh, we found that with increasing problem gambling severity, we saw increasing odds, typically, of a wide range of um, uh, Axis one DSM-4 uh, disorders. Uh, these are the disorders, the, the data for men. These are odds ratios, and the asterisks indicate statistically significant values. Um, for women, it's even more robust of an association uh, where problem gambling severity is showing a relationship across a range of um, affective um, and substance use disorders. Um, if we look at an interaction where the um, uh, we look statistically at the relationship between uh, men and women, women tend to show a stronger relationship between psychopathology and problem gambling severity. And so um, this raises the question about how we can use this knowledge of co-occurring disorders um, for um, considering how to treat people um, and for testing and developing uh, treatment algorithms, because other data suggests that their shared genetic features underlie these uh, co-occurrences, so linking to uh, presumably to biological factors. So in um, one randomized uh, clinical trial that John Grant and I conducted, um, we looked at individuals with um, gambling disorder and um, anxiety uh, disorders, um, and this was a range of anxiety disorders, and we tested s citalopram and we saw a concurrent decrease in uh, problem gambling severity and um, anxiety uh, symptomatology. This is the open label phase of a, um, an open label followed by double blind discontinuation, and it, the discontinuation was associated with a resumption of symptomatology, whereas randomization to active drug was associated with sustained improvement. Um, also, um, alcohol use disorder frequently co-occurs with gambling disorder, and um, there are medications that are approved for alcohol use disorder, and of these, we thought that naltrexone and other um, opioid receptor antagonists might be uh, particularly relevant to study, uh, given that they have been found to reduce craving and thus uh, diminish engagement in addictive behaviors in alcohol use disorder. And to date, there have been four randomized uh, clinical trials that have found naltrexone or nalmefine to be superior to placebo in treating uh, gambling disorder. Uh, to varying degrees. Uh, these are data from one of those trials uh, where uh, nalmefine at 25 milligrams per day seemed to be the most efficacious and the uh, most well tolerated, and this is approximately equivalent to 50 milligrams per day of um, naltrexone. Um, so uh, I will uh, move forward. I'm going to move forward to um, some of the um, uh, pharmacotherapy algorithm that we have proposed uh, that uh, is based on willingness to take a medication as well as um, uh, co-occurring disorders. And then um, we have now modified this in the Nature Reviews Disease Primer article to consider integrating uh, behavioral therapies uh, with the pharmacotherapies and would like to just move forward in the talk to um, precision medicine uh, considerations um, with respect to um, cognitive and uh, emotional aspects. So um, these uh, trials, um, this trial that John Grant and colleagues conducted focused on uh, COMT. There's an allelic variant of the gene uh, that is associated with uh, the enzymatic activity of the um, the gene product, and their tocopone is a COMT inhibitor, so it was um, hypothesized that those who had high um, activity uh, might respond preferentially to tocopone. Uh, that was observed um, here, uh, where better response was seen in the valval uh, genotype individuals as compared to MET-MET. 
And furthermore, uh, there was improved um, engagement or greater engagement of frontal parietal circuitry uh, following tocopone treatment um, in the individuals with uh, gambling disorder. Similarly, we have looked at um, emotional um, processing and uh, dopamine beta hydroxylase, which is a, a gene that uh, codes for an enzyme that is involved in dopamine norepinephrine uh, conversion, um, has a functional allelic variant that accounts for about 35 to 50 percent of the enzymatic activity. And the individuals who are T carriers show less empathy, lower conscientiousness, higher neuroticism, more novelty seeking and greater drug use severity. And so we hypothesized that um, these individuals would show differences, particularly in um, emotional responses, both subjectively to um, videotapes as well as on a, a brain-based level. And we saw main effects of DBH genotype as well as a, an interaction between uh, DBH and the brain imaging condition, uh, whether to sad, cocaine-related, or gambling-related videos. Uh, basically, uh, the main effect showed um, uh, that CC individuals, uh, those who have greater empathy, uh, showed greater responses in cortico striatal limbic uh, systems. Uh, and this was mainly due to responses during the SAD videotapes um, and involved uh, the thalamus, putamen, insula, and hippocampus. So we think that these clues of um, uh, specific genotypes, but perhaps um, more broadly, a broad range of um, allelic variant differences uh, may contribute to precision medicine over time. So um, overall, uh, there are differences in pharmacotherapies for uh, specific addictive disorders. There are gaps that remain uh, as addictions re remain a, um, a major public health uh, uh, concern and that we um, need to better uh, translate improved biological understandings into better uh, treatments. So I'd like to thank a, a large number of people, funding agencies, and thank you, Alex, for keeping me uh, close to on time uh, and giving uh, Hamid some time. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Whirlwind, you know, ro either roller coaster ride or a whirlwind tour. I would prefer the whirlwind tour. Um, any observations, questions? I'm trying to... Thank you, Mark, for this uh, very nice overview. The effect that you showed with nalmefine was, was quite uh, impressive. So why isn't it more distributed across the world? So the, the question was about nalmefine and its availability worldwide. Um, and in the U.S., it doesn't have an indication for any disorder, so it cannot be used off-label. Um, it's not available in the U.S. It's available in some other countries, so it may be used off-label. Nalmefine, as compared to naltrexone, tends to have less propensity for liver toxicity. Um, and the study that I showed, uh, which was a, a, a multi-site randomized clinical trial um, involving uh, multiple uh, centers across uh, North America, um, it, it found um, that the, particularly the 25, but across a range of doses, it was superior to uh, placebo. That being said, a subsequent study, um, while showing some positive results for people who had initiated taking the medication, did not produce as robust effects, and it uh, essentially has not moved forward in terms of an indication for gambling disorder, and hence is uh, less available. But one of the slides I didn't show was that um, individuals who are family history positive for alcoholism tend to respond preferentially to opioid receptor antagonism, uh, antagonists. So this is another way in which pharmacotherapies may be preferentially directed towards individuals off-label. Thank you. Short question, needing a short answer. So the, the question was uh, about the use of N-acetylcysteine in managing um, particularly cannabis use disorder, uh, cocaine use disorder, but it's also, there are also data from uh, gambling disorder. And so this is largely based on um, initially preclinical work that Peter Kalivas and colleagues conducted, um, and uh, people have been um, conducting clinical trials in 
uh, these different uh, patient populations, and there are some uh, preliminary results. Typically, so this is an over-the-counter over um, medication. It's a, a dietary supplement and an amino acid uh, derivative that um, uh, initially is dosed at typically 600 milligrams per day, can be advanced to, say, 1,800 milligrams per day. It tends to be well-tolerated. Um, and so I would uh, direct people towards um, some of the uh, published studies.